For our session today, devoted to the scientific world, we will have five presentations of 15 minutes each. Although you have the summarized biography in the agenda, I would like and I would be grateful if each speaker could briefly introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentation. The presentation will be in English, mainly. And if you want the translation, do not forget to choose the, the different channel in the Zoom setting of your computer. And the material of this presentation will be available after the regional meeting on the website was address will be communicated to you later or sent to you directly. Last but not least, I just recall you that each session is recorded in order to allow uh, the one who are not able to attend in, in live to uh, be able to see, to watch those record afterwards. Without further ado, uh, I will give the floor to Professor Derek Lynch, Professor of Agronomy and Agroecology in the Department of Plants, Food and Environmental Science in the Faculty of Agriculture at Aldousie University, Aldousie University, Dalhousie University, sorry, for his presentation, which is entitled Various Initiatives to Measure Soil Health in Canada and North America. Professor Derek Lynch, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this workshop and for the Regeneration Canada team. Uh, congratulations on putting together such a, a wonderful monthly stakeholder event. So I'll just share my screen. And I hope you can all see my, my screen uh, and, uh, and can hear me clearly. Great. So uh, I'm going to um, talk uh, primarily about, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus mostly on some examples of uh, projects and advances in soil health in Eastern Canada. And to do that, uh, I'll just um, I'm going to just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, some of the challenges in developing soil health tests, uh, developing regional databases. Uh, as we develop a suite of tests in soil health, how robust uh, are the tests? Are they sensitive to management practices and farming practices? Uh, there are challenges with spatial and temporal variability. And these are many of the same challenges we have with tracking soil carbon. Also, I'm going to talk briefly about some examples of uh, assessing farmer engagement and interest in soil health and farmer initiatives on farmer led initiatives on soil health. And lastly, the way forward, uh, hopefully tackle at least one of the questions posed for the panel today. So if we look at uh, just the, the context in, in, in Eastern Canada, um, there's, as others have noted, uh, a Quebec presenter earlier this week noted as well, uh, the trend has been in Eastern Canada towards um, intensification of agriculture. And by that, I mean a reduction in perennial crops, a reduction in pasture and hay fields and hay production because of less livestock and an increase in annual crop production, corn, soybeans, uh, uh, wheat production, uh, across Eastern Canada with, with other crops included in that mix as well. Uh, I mean, from a point of view of soil carbon, the, the, the issue here is that generally that trend has, is leading to a, a reduction in soil carbon or soil carbon losses because of lower residue, uh, more tillage. And the, the top right picture here is a picture of no-till soybeans. And uh, soybeans is a very uh, productive crop, but the residue re re remaining behind from soybeans is very low. And there's a lot of bare soil, as you can see on that no-till field. Uh, and typically in humid regions of North America, whether it's BC or Eastern Canada, we don't see a gain in, with no-till systems in soil carbon. No-till may have benefits in terms of soil health, but less so in terms of soil carbon less dramatically than seen on the Canadian prairies. So I'll just focus in now on Atlantic Canada. If we look at PEI and this slides uh, provided by my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Naranesia at uh, Ag Canada in, in PEI. And 
EEI has had a remarkable database uh, and facility uh, over the last 22 years. They have a, a province-wide network of uh, geo-reference monitoring sites for soil quality. So almost 800 sites that they're tracking and collecting soil quality data across the whole province on a three-year cycle. And using that database, um, they've been able to really look at the influence of cropping systems on soil quality. Uh, I'll just flag one of the outputs of that data is that uh, they've noted that even with a mandatory three-year potato system, uh, we still, they're still seeing a decline in soil carbon and soil organic matter, if you prefer. And the reason being because the residues for, one of the reasons being because the residues of the rotation crops are not being retained, whether that's the hay or, or straw. Uh, in that, and that uh, is leading to that continuing decline in soil organic matter. And that's just the uh, cycles of tr trends in soil organic matter. Things they base uh, in a recent collaboration uh, with Tander Fraser at AFC, uh, uh, Hannah Arsenal, uh, uh, a master's student working with myself and Tendra. Is, has um, uh, uh, isolated uh, 10 fields per, or I should say, has uh, selected 10 fields re uh, representing a, a range in spectrum of intensity from low to high intensity uh, within that database and is assessing the effects of soil health of that spectrum of intensity of management in terms of tillage, residue, cropping system, diversity, et cetera. Uh, both in terms, assessing soil health both use in Cornell soil health frameworks of soil uh, health assessment, but also using a, a novel approach of using nematodes as a bioindicator species, looking at the soil food web connectivity and function as well. A, a larger regional project over the last uh, five years, uh, led by uh, Dr. Dave Burton at Dalhousie and myself, it was the establishment of the Atlantic uh, Soil Health Lab. This is funded by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And the central uh, focus of that initiative was to develop a, 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 a regional database of soil health across agricultural sectors in Atlantic Canada, and to help spur development of a regionally relevant soil health test. And our starting point was the, the sort of integrated framework of physical, chemical, biological parameters. Um, uh, so we're modifying and adapting the Cornell, if you can call it, the CASH uh, framework for soil health assessment. And of course, some of these are quite novel tests for the region and for producers in the region to be regularly testing aggregate stability, for example, a resistance of soil structure to, to intense rainfall events, and then uh, measurements of different fractions of uh, biological uh, soil activity. Uh, the important thing to take from this graph, though, is that organic matter is the key element. Uh, it's the, the keystone element, uh, whether you call it organic matter or soil carbon. So we're not only tracking soil carbon, we're tracking active soil carbon as well. Uh, the idea there is that uh, it, it can be very useful to look at more dynamic fractions of soil organic matter that are more sensitive to total than total organic matter to changes in management regime or cropping history. Um, and so we do that in a number of ways, physically, chemically, uh, biologically, basically asking the microbes of how much active, uh, available organic matter there is. I'm just going to mention the central one here, POX. That's a, a, a chemical oxidase, oxidization of, of the active organic matter. It, um, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment with a little bit of data, just a brief bit of data to show the usefulness of these tests. So going back to total organic matter, similarly in Nova Scotia, we see some, some cropping systems are very intensive in terms of uh, row cropping, low residues, lots of tillage, and intensive horticultural production or intensive vegetable production is one such example. And we see as a result, we have, it's typically much lower soil organic matter or soil carbon compared to field crop and perennial cropping systems. If we take that sec uh, those four different sectors now and look at them in terms of active carbon or POX carbon, 
uh, we see a good segregation. This, this uh, test it looks to be quite robust. And many other studies across North America are finding POX to be quite a sensitive test and quite a, a robust test and a useful test for picking up uh, nuances in, in uh, cropping practices. And it, you see it's much lower for the intensive vegetable systems than the other production systems. Just to switch to another parameter, physical parameter, water stable aggregates. So how resistant is the structure of that soil to an intense rainfall event? Well, we're, we see with the pasture for system, for example, pasture systems, as we'd expect, it's very resilient, 80% or more of the soil structure, the aggregates are resistant to an intense rainfall event, intermediate for field crop, but quite low. In other words, that soil is very, uh, uh, fragile and easily dispersed by intense rainfall events in that intensive production system. But it's a more variable uh, parameter. It's, it's, it's sensitive, but, but more variable. So these are some of the considerations in the development of uh, soil health tests. Another aspect we're, uh, we're interested in is if we are declining soil carbon in some of these intensive systems and our starting point is a fairly low organic are we getting to a tipping point of uh, a fundamental tipping to a function even as it relates to carbon uh, uh, sequestration is there key aspects soil enzyme activity etc that's being compromised perhaps as we get to a low soil organic carbon level and the x-axis here is just if you can think of it as from zero to two percent uh, soil carbon as we get down to one percent soil carbon we're into far lower levels of active carbon, we see lower respiration, we see a uh, marked decline in, in soil health overall across this larger database. So that's, uh, an that's a focus of a master student, Anders Fish, uh, working with me currently. Uh, we're very delighted. This was one of the, the main uh, goals of our initiative, the uh, Regional Soil Health Initiative, was to try and support the development of re routine tests for, for producers. And we're working with the provinces uh, around uh, uh, the Maritimes in this regard. And just last fall, the PEI, Department of Agriculture and uh, Lands, has uh, building on the database uh, we worked on collaboratively with PEI, uh, launched a soil health testing service for producers. And their goal there is to provide a, 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 a initially a subsidized test and to help producers essentially develop a, a baseline uh, of understanding of where their soil health is. Uh, I'm going to have to move on a little quick and to uh, uh, so spatial assessment, a very interesting study from New Brunswick where they're trying to they were able to relate soil health distribution across the field in terms of essentially management zones and relate that back to soil organic matter. Uh, quality and quantity, and that's the sort of direction we need to go in terms of spatial understanding. Temporal variability, a new project in uh, changes in time or within a rotation, new project in Quebec with Carolyn Hall at Laval. We're looking within organic sector uh, systems, is there differences in, in uh, changes in soil health and soil carbon within the rotation? And uh, and just briefly, uh, we were using earthworms uh, as one indicator and see a real variation in within the rotation phase as an indicator of changes in soil health. And in earthworms are really of interest in Quebec because of compaction as an issue in soil health. Uh, last study I want to flag is the assessment we did, uh, this is Carl and Mann's masters, looking at farmer attitude towards soil health and their understanding of soil health and their receptivity to a new test on soil health. In this study, it was very, very different farms, conventional organic, vegetable, livestock, etc. And essentially, I'll just the takeaway, uh, we found again lower intensi intensity uh, history, more soil health, more mycorrhizae, more fungi. We looked at a microbial assessment as well. But it's the, the, the note in green I want to flag. In spite of a lack of agreement of soil health with their own ranking of their fields, their first initial ranking, most of the farmers found the results soil health test useful and were planning changes. So there's a, a, a tremendous interest in soil health among the agricultural community and studies in the US have shown this as well. 
Uh, there's, and in many cases, the farming community are well ahead of the scientists. And I'll just, uh, second to last slide, flag any number of farmer organizations that are doing tremendous work in developing soil health and publishing scientific papers. This is the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario. I happened to be at their conference last year. And, and this is a very good study on the sensitivity, repeatability, of soil health indicators in Ontario, uh, 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 project um, directed by uh, um, uh, researchers working with the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario. So lastly, uh, I'll only answer the first of our questions, or six questions, research priorities. I think monitoring is really important. How that's done, is it a farmer tracking their own baseline? Is it a provincial network of uh, soil health tracking uh, uh, routinely? Is it demonstration sites? We need regional data on how rotation changes, et cetera, influence it. And uh, so it could be even technologies and remote sensing, et cetera. But essentially we need a more localized, uh, uh, valid regional uh, understanding of subtle changes in soil health with management practices. With that in mind, I think fundamentally we're talking about an additional four R's, the central pillars of agronomy. We have four R's for nutrient management, but I think there's another four R's that have to be uh, developed uh, an understanding of the changes in rotation, residue management, rate of tillage intensity, Resources within any potential or sector, how does that influence soil carbon sequestration and how does that influence uh, soil health overall? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, uh, for this uh, presentation. That uh, was very interesting. We, we've been all around Canada and uh, you give some good information about the relation with the scientists and the farmers and and what you think important to, to develop in the future. So um, I just would like to remind to our participant that uh, we will group the question of this to the speaker at the end of the session. You can already assign like to the question if they are the only one at the moment, but uh, keep asking question and, uh, and like those questions that will help us to uh, give the, the order and to provide the order for asking them to the, to the speakers. Our second speaker is Dr. Brandon Hug, uh, also from Dalhousie University, who will be presenting an approach to carbon stock modeling. So Dr. Brandon Hug, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, just get my screen started. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the regional meeting uh, for the invitation to talk with all of you today. Um, welcome to my home. <laughs> I'm Brandon Hyung and I was uh, recently hired in 2017 as an assistant professor at Dalhousie University uh, where I'm trying to get my soil landscapes analysis and modeling lab off the ground. Uh, my research is in the area of digital soil mapping which is the intersecting field of soil science and geographical information systems or GIS. Br Brandon please can you speak uh, louder? Oh okay sure. Um, yes thank you. So this uh, eventually led to my role as co-chair of the Canadian Digital Soil Mapping Working Group of the Canadian Society of Soil Science in eight, uh, 2018. Um, and today I'll be focusing on the role of the working group in modeling and monitoring carbon, uh, where the Canadian scientific community fits within the larger international initiatives, and really focusing on some of the key challenges related to these activities. Uh, but of course, much of this is based off my own observations and perspectives and where I think things are going. Okay, so pedometrics is an interdisciplinary branch of soil science and is largely an intersecting field of soil science, proximal and remote sensing, uh, GIS and statistics. And one of the key goals of a pedometrician is to leverage technological advances in GIS, uh, remote sensing and artificial intelligence to develop uh, soil maps that are more accurate and precise than what is currently available uh, through conventional paper maps. And by doing so, we are able to provide knowledge of soil variability over space and time. Now, the techniques developed by this community serves multiple purposes, but largely for this talk, I will frame our role around these activities. We are talking about things like soil carbon sequestration or changes in the soil health. Uh, we also need to talk about uh, the current soil status. Uh, 
And then in particular, we need to understand how soil properties vary over space. And digital soil map is the basis for capturing and visualizing that variability. And by going through the process of creating these maps, uh, we can better understand the controls on soil patterns, whether it be related to topo uh, topographic, geologic, climatic, or a combination of those factors. And ultimately, if we have a way to quantify these baseline conditions, and presumably we can also better understand the spatial and temporal changes of these important processes, such as carbon sequestration. And really, if we have the capacity to model and monitor soil properties, then we can also evaluate soil functions, uh, whether it relate, uh, be related to carbon sequestration, uh, food and fiber production, water security, and so forth. But the role of a pedometrician shouldn't just end at making an attractive looking map. That map must serve a function and should be used to communicate information to stakeholders and decision makers. So that means that part of our job is to create decision making tools uh, by interpreting these maps uh, for those users. And for example, a soil erosion risk or a crop suitability map is probably more useful uh, to a decision maker or a farmer than individual maps of soil properties. So it's really a matter of synthesizing complex spatial information to something that is a little bit more digestible. To promote uh, and recognize the importance of soils, the international community formed the global. So, soil sorry, Brendan. Brendan, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Can you uh, speak a little bit louder and close to the, your mic because your mic is just variating the, the sound and the translator oh. has a lot of difficulty to follow you. So, oh, sorry. If you can um, speak uh, not so quick and uh, closer to your mic, thank you. Okay, sorry, I don't have a mic, uh, like an actual microphone, but um, so as I was saying, to promote and recognize the importance of soils, uh, the international community formed the Global Soil Partnership and the Intergovernmental uh, Technical Panel on Soils. Um, and this initiative was undertaken by the FAO in 2012. And one of the crowning achievements of this initiative was the release of the Status of the World Soil Resources Report in 2015, uh, which coincided with the International Year of Soils. So within the international context, uh, Pillar 4 was designed to act as an authoritative global system to monitor and forecast the conditions of the Earth's soil, uh, soil resources with three primary functions, uh, providing answers to global scale soil issues, uh, supporting local decisions within the global context and providing soil data for understanding earth system processes to address global scale and natural resource issues. And largely these data sets need to be compatible with other global data sets. To fully understand the challenges related to digital soil mapping, uh, one needs to understand how these maps are made. Uh, in other words, what are the inputs and what comes out of the mapping process? In other words, the outputs. To oversimplify things, I'll say that there are three ingredients. So the first one uh, are the environmental layers. Uh, and these layers, which we often refer to as covariates, uh, represent the environmental conditions by which soil observations are made from. Uh, so if you've taken a soil science course and you should be familiar with the Yeni's five factors of soil formation. Uh, which basically says that soil variability is controlled by environmental factors that represent climate, organisms, relief, parent material, and time. And the key thing to recognize is that with these factors, they are simply variables that can be represented as spatial data layers, uh, all of which can be required from remote sensing and other sources. So for example, in the left-hand panel, I have a series of layers that show uh, elevation, land cover, annual precipitation and mean annual temperature. And overall, these data sets are really easy to come by and easy to access. And furthermore, they're becoming increasingly available due to technological advances in remote sensing. So new satellites with, uh, that are equipped with better sensors can acquire data at higher levels of detail and at greater frequencies. And the ability to frequently capture data is going to be key to monitoring uh, changes in soil. So in short, environmental data is becoming increasingly available and is relatively easy to acquire. The next ingredient is the georeferenced soil observations. And when I say georeferenced, I mean that uh, for every sample location, we take a corresponding measurement of spatial position uh, using a GPS. And for every sample, we can make series, a series of field measurements or take samples uh, from a profile and have them analyzed in a lab. 
So whereas environmental data is easy to come by, uh, this data is far harder because anybody that has been involved with soil surveying, uh, the whole sampling process is very expensive and time consuming to carry out. If you want to make a good soil map, conventional wisdom would su suggest that uh, more soil observations are needed. So in the right-hand image, this uh, is a soil survey campaign that was carried out by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs uh, for the Ottawa County and my good colleague, Daniel Surrett. Um, so here they had sampled approximately 1600 locations in that county. Uh, as I will talk a little bit about later, uh, one of the greatest challenges related to soil mapping is that the soil data is held by multiple holders, uh, whether they be from academia, government, or industry. And compiling all the data into a single repository is a major undertaking. The last ingredient is the predictive model. Uh, so in soil mapping for each sample location with known soil properties, we're able to drill down into a stack of environmental layers and extract their values to create something that we call a training data set. And here we can take that training data set and predict, uh, fit a predictive model and make predictions for unobserved locations. Uh, this is a process by which we refer to as spatial interpolation. And given the rise of artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning, uh, there are hundreds of different types of predictive models that can be tested. So to sum, the greatest bottleneck is acquiring the georeferenced soil data. And if you think about it, uh, creating a soil map isn't a huge challenge because all the methods are fairly standardized. So it's really a problem about uh, soil sampling and uh, soil data. <clears throat> so in terms of the outputs, there are three main things. The first one is a predictive soil map. So again, we fit a predictive model, apply that model over the entire study area, and generate predictions of a soil property. Uh, here we have uh, soil predictions for the 0 to 5 centimeter and 30 to, 30 to 60 centimeter depth increments on the left, uh, where the lighter colors represent low carbon and darker colors represent higher, uh, higher carbon. And in addition, we also have estimates of uncertainty. So uh, in addition to estimating how much carbon there is in the landscape, we also need to know how confident our predictions are. And as per international standards, maps should be accompanied by 90% prediction interval maps. And in the middle panel, the darker colors represent high uncertainty. And lastly, uh, we need accuracy metrics. So we need to be able to measure how good our maps are. Uh, and there are many different types of metrics, but the one that I generally focus on is concordance. Uh, this metric quantifies the amount of agreement between observed and predicted values. So in this case, we have accuracies of 65 and 62 percent, which is actually quite good. So one of the most compelling examples that I can show is a comparison of a conventional soil map on the left uh, and digital soil map on the right. Uh, so this is for the Keene County in southern Ontario and as you can see here, uh, conventional approaches are far less able to capture the subtle uh, topographic characteristics. And in this example, the difference in precision is quite remarkable. And with this level of detail, a land manager would be far better equipped to carry out sustainable soil management practices on a targeted basis. Although digital soil mapping research has been carried out uh, around the globe as early as the 1990s and perhaps even earlier, in Canada, this was something that had started to emerge around 2010. Um, however, over the last 10 years, we had made tons of progress and the enthusiasm and support by the math community has also been growing. And over the last 20 years, the soil science community has evolved from the dominance of government soil surveyors and university soil, uh, scientists to a community where scientists with soil expertise are working in every public and pri uh, private sector. And this includes agriculture, forestry, environment, remediation, and so forth. And across every ecosystem as well. So, the decentralization of soil-related work was necessary to meet the growing demands of soil expertise, but it also led to a dispersion of soil information and expertise as well. And out of that recognition, Canadian soil mappers established the Canadian uh, Soil Mapping Working Group in 2016, and this is governed by the Pedology Committee of the Canadian Society of Soil Science. The main objective was to re-centralize that expertise and create a community that would be tasked with developing national scale soil mapping products that meet international specifications. Uh, for example, the community developed the soil carbon map for submission uh, to the FAO's 
uh, Global Carbon Mapping Project in 2017. And in addition, the community also recognized the importance of training the next generation of mappers. And to that end, uh, we've offered multiple training workshops to people across the country. And currently, the working group has approximately 40 to 50 members, and some of our colleagues are involved with the UN's Global uh, Slow Partnership, as well as the ITPS. Um, but the key thing to recognize is that we have colleagues from the agricultural, agricultural and forestry sectors, and co colleagues from the provincial and federal agencies and colleagues from multiple academic institutions. Again, our first contribution was a Canadian soil organic carbon map that was submitted to the FAO in 2017. Our submission was an amalgamation of individual mapping projects from different members, so there are many limitations with that. Um, but largely, it was very much a learning experience for all of us, so there's definitely room for improvement. But the main thing here was that we were able to demonstrate that a community of soil mappers with very limited resources could work together on a voluntary basis. And ultimately, the goal of all of this is to strive to provide tier three estimates, which are gold standard in carbon reporting. And these uh, estimates provide location by location estimations of carbon using uh, measurement based soil information. And these estimates could be essentially be a soil carbon map that provides estimates of the carbon pool and related uncertainties. In terms of soil data collection, my view is that uh, Canada should look into existing initiatives around the world. Uh, and in my opinion, the gold standard comes from the EU and the development of the Lucas top soil data set. So this freely available data set comprises of approximately 45,000 top soil samples with partial to full analytical data. Given this massive data sets, um, digital soil mappers have the capacity to provide the necessary information to help address some of the biggest environmental challenges of our time. For example, the data set can be used to establish baseline soil carbon that is critical to monitoring changes. As well, the baseline information could also help us better understand carbon, dynamic, uh, carbon dynamics under future climate and management scenarios. And this information is necessary to help us understand the issues related to climate change and food security. And likewise, the data could also be used to uh, map soil health indicators to help assess things like crop suitability and biomass production, things that directly relate to food and energy security. Another example includes a continental scale estimates of the carbon sequestration potential, something that could greatly help with international reporting. And if we can better understand these patterns, we can provide a spatial context to the opportunities and threats related to carbon sequestration. And within Canada, a prime example of modeling and monitoring carbon can be found at PEI, which Derek had talked about earlier. And within Canada's smallest province, there's a network of 230 sites, uh, and they were monitored from um, over a course of 18 years. And here, the red color represents organic matter of greater than 4%, which uh, covered a fairly large region between 1988 and 2000. Uh, however, by 2013 to 2015, uh, there were significant declines and in some places, uh, there was less than 2% organic matter. And my colleague, Dr. Lynch, would probably say that there are also large areas that experience similar declines throughout the entire Atlantic region. So as Canadians, we really need to think about how these sorts of initiatives can be scaled up. So again, what I'm trying to say is that with all this mapping stuff, the bottleneck isn't really related to mapping methods or people power. It's really a lack of available soil data to make these maps. In fact, I would probably argue that Canada is experiencing a renaissance in soil survey. And this is uh, largely evidenced by all these ongoing projects by my colleagues across the countries, across governmental agencies, and across sectors. And in fact, you will hear from Dr. Como who will uh, who's doing a regional assessment of soil health, and also Ms. Cornish on Friday, who is running an agricultural soil carbon mapping project in Alberta. So I will end my presentation with a series of challenges that I believe the soil mapping community is facing. Um, and I will also emphasize that none of these challenges are really methodological or technologically related. First and foremost is data sharing. Uh, we need to develop a data sharing framework that meets the requirement of academia, government, and industry while respecting privacy rights. And this has to occur between sectors, uh, provincial agencies, and federal agencies. I also believe that the government must take a leadership role by exploring the different tools at their disposal to encourage data sharing. 
And again, we need to think about what are the carrots and what are the sticks that can be used, but also we need farmers and industry to want to share data. Um, with the way these predictive models work, having soil information on, neighbor, uh, on my neighbor's farm will help me understand my farm better. And this also applies to larger scales as well. So me having information about the soils in Atlantic Canada will also help me better understand the soils in British Columbia. The importance of soil data has not been ignored by the Canadian government. So for example, in May 2019, the Standing Senate Committee on Agriculture and Forestry had a hearing related to soil health and soil protection. Now there, the importance of place-based data was recognized throughout the hearing. But even though the policymakers can identify the uh, importance of data sharing, it doesn't change the fact that data remains dispersed, partial, and not harmonized, and not easily accessible. And this isn't a problem that is unique to Canada. It is actually a problem recognized by the broader international community. So these soil mapping initiatives shouldn't be purely driven by research in uh, researchers and government and academia. And thus far, the working group has collaborated effectively on a voluntary basis. And this is evidenced by our ability to produce the first version of the Canadian Soil Organic Carbon Stock Map in 2017. However, we can do a lot better in trying to engage more effectively with the private sector, uh, who are also collecting soil data for various purposes. Now, in terms of the government, I would ask, what are the carrots and the sticks that we can use to encourage uh, data sharing? And also, what are the methods for communicating the needs and the benefits of data sharing to the agricultural and forestry sectors? The data uh, would also come from multiple data holders. So it is also necessary to ensure that we develop a common data structure that would, in, uh, that would be interoperable with national and international data repositories. There also needs to be a mechanism to ensure that whenever new data is acquired, the central repository could be easily updated. And out of all these challenges, I think that this is probably the least challenging. Um, we also need ways to ensure the longevity of the data and make sure that there are people to manage and update it. Uh, this might not seem like a glamorous job, but it is uh, absolutely essential. And overall, the working uh, group believes in a federated model whereby the data is duplicated and stored across multiple academic institutions and government agencies, because backing up data is always a good thing to do. And lastly, um, the members of the working group have operated largely on a voluntary basis. Um, and we can absolutely take a leadership role in continuing to coordinate uh, the national mapping initiatives, um, but we also uh, and also continue to contribute our technical expertise. Uh, but we can't be treating these initiatives as side projects that we currently are. And furthermore, as an academic, many conventional research funding opportunities revolve around one to five year projects. And when I'm thinking about the future of digital soil information, I'm thinking about 25 years and, below, uh, and beyond. So sure, uh, short term funding can be used as a springboard for research, innovation, and development. Uh, but long-term funding is required to ensure that the data will continue to exist and be updated. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all the hardworking soil mappers across the country, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Brandon. Well, that's a problem with the scientists. When you give them 15 minutes, they use 20 minutes. They, they right. are so enthusiastic that the, the time is running so fast for them. Well. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I just would like to recall you to ask your question on the Q&A for all those uh, speakers and we will share this question with them later on. So stay with us, uh, Mr. Hug. No problem. Stop share. Thank you. So now let me turn the floor over to Professor Keith Postian of Colorado State University for a presentation entitled Reflection on Opportunities, Barrier, and the Future of Soil Carbon Solution. Dear, dear Professor Postian, dear Keith, you have the floor. Thank you, Jean, uh, Paul. Uh, let's see if I can get this, uh, if I can get this working. And let's see uh, if I swap this. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much again to the, the organizers and and uh, for for the opportunity to come here uh, and be be part of this uh, be part of this meeting 
And uh, so what I want to do is, is really talk about, um, I guess, give a little bit of a report card from my point of view on, on what's happening here in the U.S., particularly as it relates to kind of barriers and, and future prospects for, for soil carbon solutions, soil health and carbon sequestration, uh, and, and really talk then about how how I think the, that, that interfaces with the, the science priorities and, and trying to address some of the, the questions that, that, uh, that the group has been charged with here. So I'm gonna call this notes from, from down south. And uh, uh, I think despite, uh, it's, it's somewhat surprising perhaps that despite all the things going on and the, the, the COVID and the, the general chaos in our national, Public life, perhaps that that in fact it's it's surprising. I, I really think there's been growing interest and engagement in in issues relating to soil carbon solutions in the U.S. and that's evidenced by a number of things that we, for example, had continued, uh, you know, perhaps even increased federal investment from USDA in particular. A lot of that, of course, is is really couched as as soil health, but but nonetheless, there's also um, you know, attention being given to to climate change mitigation opportunities. States have have uh, have really stepped up their engagement. There's a U.S. Climate Alliance that is uh, perhaps the the main thing they're known for is trying to maintain the the Paris Accord uh, commitments. And and right now, about 50 percent of the states belong to this, and a number of those states have soil health and soil carbon initiatives. Uh, we've seen a lot of engagement from major NGOs, Nature Conservancy, EDF, World Resource, uh, uh, Resources Institute, and many others. Uh, and also continue, you know, more and more you look at ag product industries, whether they're in the business of, of food products, clothing, looking at sustainable supply chains, trying to, to really promote low carbon products and and a number of these major companies also have fairly aggressive, uh, at least uh, at least stated uh, carbon neutrality goals. And so they're they're looking at sort of insetting and in, in various ways in which they could, uh, you know, change their operations or or working with their producers to to try to achieve that. And then finally, I want to kind of focus on what I think has emerged really. To me, it almost seems like in the last few months and. And there have been some changes here, but I think everyone is, has seen in just in the newspaper that, that major companies in the tech sector and in particular and banking and others uh, have come out in and uh, with quite you know aggressive carbon neutrality goals, at least at least stated, publicly stated ones. The, and uh, you know, certainly before the COVID crisis, you saw, you know, energy companies, airlines, likewise doing the same. I think they're perhaps in a in a somewhat different uh, category now for the for the time being. But certainly, you know, we've all heard of Google and Microsoft and and others like this, and Amazon making uh, you know quite quite ambitious uh, targets. And so they're looking at not only emission reductions and their scope one and and, and scope two emissions, but also looking at at at, at carbon at uh, carbon neutrality, uh, also involving um, carbon dioxide removal. And a lot of those companies, I think, are looking. They're they're sort of naturally predisposed to perhaps look at engineering solutions. But I think there's there's growing interest as well in the soil side. And and I think again, you know, what's the attractiveness of of soil based solutions versus some of the other kind of carbon dioxide removal uh, potentials. And, and I think, you know, certainly one is, is compared to things like direct air capture, BECS, you know, the, the idea of, of, of low cost uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches. I think also the environmental coal benefits, we've talked a lot about soil health, water quality, climate resilience here today. Uh, these are all things that I think these, these companies and firms are looking at you know, as well as other kind of social uh, goods, if you will. Um, but I think in, in sort of looking at it from, from the perspective of some of these businesses, I, I do think that, that there are, I see the, 
kind of emerging what I would call the, the key barriers to scale up. And, and it's kind of asking the question, so if we're really gonna go big, if we're gonna be looking at carbon dioxide removal and soil, we've got four per mil. So we're talking about gigaton per year capacities. And so what's hindering the really large investment in soil based carbon removal approaches. And I think it boils down, this is a little bit of personal opinion, but I think it kind of comes down to, to two major issues that, that these companies and others that are potentially interested in large investments are, are asking. And one is, is specifically with respect to soils, they're wondering about quantification and they're really almost saying, okay, how do I know that, that what I'm paying for is, is real? Uh, and the other part is, uh, I think, is permanence. And they want to have uh, assurance that, that, that what they invest in is, isn't going to go away uh, in, in a few years. And, you know, I think all of us that have worked in this, in this area for a number of years, you know, recognize these are not new realizations. But it really seems to me that among the many kinds of things that we see as barriers, these are, are are the, 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 the main ones that, that I'm hearing. And I think there's a, a way in which the scientific community can, can uh, help to overcome these barriers. And there's two different ways to, I, I think, where, where our efforts could help kind of create a, I'll call it a virtuous cycle for, for bringing soil-based solutions to scale. And the one on the right-hand side is, Okay, we've got to, uh, in the end of the day, I think we've got to find a way to, to have practices and, and technologies that in themselves are, in the long run, more profitable. They will be continued if, uh, if, if, if farmers adopt them and really get to know how, how to use those, then there's much less uh, concerns about, about permanence risk that they're that it's going to go away if it's a if it's a better practice uh and, and you can get to it then then the the chances of of maintaining that over time is better but of course a lot of us know or i think all of us probably recognize that there are you know risk uh issues that that to deal with and so there are definitely the need for financial incentives to to get over that and then on the other side, quantification, you know, I think improved quantification then gives more confidence to, to business, to other actors in this space. And so, you know, with these kind of interventions, I think you, you have the possibility then of, of increasing the profitability of the, of the producers, leading to increased adoption, leading to an increased supply of carbon removal that can be sourced by companies looking for for, for, for that, and then you get increased investments, and that essentially drives this, uh, you know, this whole process. So I think that's, that's where uh, uh, a couple of the main barriers and, and where our research and, and, and efforts uh, need to be targeted. I'm going to now kind of finish up with, with talking about the, the work that, that we do uh, in, in my research group at Colorado State University, where a lot of the work we're doing is really trying to develop decision support, inventory tools, quantification methods to, to, to better, um, uh, yeah, be able to gauge and understand how our practices are, are changing soil carbon contents and, and, and affecting greenhouse gas emissions. So I think if you look at any, any policies, whether they're governmental policy, whether they're supply chain, whether they're carbon markets, we really do need reliable metrics to, to quantify and verify the changes in soil carbon storage. So it's not so much about the stocks, it's really about the changes in stocks, right? And the changes in emission uh, rates. And, and the key attributes to those, we need to have locally based estimates. They need to be unbiased as much as possible. We can deal with some uncertainty, but we need to know what the uncertainty is. They have to be cost effective and they've got to be able to account for a wide variety of management regimes. Uh, and this isn't easy. It's a difficult job. And, and I think all of us in this, in this business are well aware of this, that first of all, we're, you know, as, as opposed to a source emission like, uh, 
uh, you know, CO2 emission from, from kind of a refinery or, or a, a power plant or something like that. We've got dispersed sinks and sources, non-point. They're, uh, they're spatially and temporally variable. Uh, annual changes are in, in soil carbon relative to the carbon that is in many soils uh, is, are small. So we've got a low uh, signal to noise ratio. And the things that govern soil carbon change are, 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 are myriad. There's, there are many different interacting processes. So it's a very complex, uh, complex situation. Um, and of course, we've, you know, we've been measuring uh, soil carbon changes and soil carbon shocks for, for a long, long time, and we've got good procedures to do that. And I guess I would say that, you know, the gold standard for that is, is involves destructive sampling and a lot of sample prep and laboratory analysis using, you know, uh, dry combustion analyzers, for example. But you know, we also a lot of us have done this work. It's it's slow, it's costly, it's labor intensive. Uh, certainly, things are are developing, such as you know, mid, mid infrared analysis that can increase sample throughput and lower the cost somewhat. Um, but you know, we're still looking at this this uh, you know th this this laborious uh, process for direct measurements. There's a lot of interest and promise in in situ carbon sensing where, you know, whether it's LIBS or near infrared or Raman spectroscopy, et cetera. And I think it's clear that these technologies offer the potential for rapid high resolution mapping of soil organic carbon. Uh, but there are some challenges with uh, accuracy and calibrations as you move to different soils and issues with soil moisture and mineralogy, et cetera. Uh, and I think that at the current time, at least, they're, they're, you know, these really work well for uh, kind of qualitative mapping of soil carbon distributions and things like this, but I don't think they're at the point yet where we can routinely, cheaply, easily measure soil carbon stock changes to inform policy and to, to monetize uh, soil carbon. Um, so, we're in a sense, if we if we insist on direct measurement everywhere uh, using our gold standard destructive measurements, you know, it's clearly I think it's too expensive for routine deployment. So we can use it, but we have to use it in a limited way. And so that really I think uh, draws us to the idea that we need to have a, a kind of an integrated quantification platform. I would say, and and this is. You know, I think various renditions of this kind of idea are, have been out in the literature for a while. This is one that was, uh, we put together for a National Academies report that came out in 2018. Uh, and I just kind of want to quickly walk through here and, 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 and sort of bring your attention to different elements of here and uh, of this, this concept and how they can work together and how our research prioritization can help uh, you know, help strengthen this. And starting off with, you know, ground measurements, uh, uh, direct measurements of soil, soil, soil carbon changes are, are, are key. And this is, you know, Brandon talked about this quite a bit and mentioned, the, you know, the Lucas data set in, in, in Europe and the International Carbon Network. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of the, the, the data that's very useful for soil carbon mapping, but I would also focus on the idea that we need, we need uh, ground-based data that can inform on changes over time in, in carbon stocks. And so that's, that's important. We need to have that empirical database. I think there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, as Brandon also talked about, to, to have more data sharing to, to ensure consistency and standardization of this. Um, so the, the, the data the, the, from monitoring networks, from long-term experiments, I think they play a critical role, particularly in, in, in our models. And I think there's uh, a, a, a need and a, a growing recognition that we really need process-based models that, uh, that reflect the dynamics that drive soil carbon changes. Uh, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. And there are a number of established models that we've been using for years in, in, in uh, inventory and forecasting. Uh, those models are 
you know, are, are, are undergoing improvement. But there's also, I think, uh, there's kind of a new generation of models that are coming on that, that are looking at what might be a more modern paradigm of, of soil organic matter stabilization, for example, and, and, and really featuring things that, that are, you know, that have explicitly measurable soil organic matter pools. And, you know, we've been working on this in, in this direction for, for a number of years, but I think it's starting to see coming a little bit more to fruition. So I think these, these kinds of process-based models are, are critical for our quantification capabilities. And then, you know, remote sensing was also, I think Brandon is brought up in, in, in his talk, but increasingly we've got availability of, of more accurate, more nuanced, more variable, uh, more, uh, yeah, of looking at different things of, of, uh, and cheaper and more available. And, and I think remote sensing uh, can play a particularly important role in helping us to, uh, to be able to, to verify and uh, what land use practices are, are occurring on the landscape, uh, as well as look back at, at uh, uh, previous land use history and, and how that's changed the, the activity data, if you will, that is you know, that, that tells us how management is, is, is being performed, which really is what we're looking at as, as, as a, a major driver of these soil carbon cha uh, stock changes. Well, I think we can also use remote sensing increasingly to help uh, improve and, and uh, uh, improve the accuracy of, of these process-based models as well. And then finally, I think this, that there's a, a real key role of of really bringing the, the grassroots, bringing the producers and their knowledge and their information into this system uh, through uh, connecting with, with uh, management data that's already collected and, and finding ways to put that into decision support systems. Uh, and I wanna then just, I guess, uh, uh, mention briefly the, the work that, that we're doing in my group but to develop a couple of decision support systems, the main one being this Comet Farm, which is really a platform that, that does embody all the, the things that I was showing earlier to, to try to put you know, models and data and, and, uh, uh, you know, and information in the hands of producers and, and folks that work with producers. And I think there's a lot of capabilities now to to use this kind of a, uh, a system at the entity scale. Uh, and we're working with, uh, uh, with, with state governments and USDA and, and, and companies and, and folks interested in carbon finance. And, and so I think this is uh, a way forward, but I would say, you know, we still have a ways to go and we've, we're, we're, we're really wanting to sort of continuously improve our, our capabilities and, uh, and I think the more we can quantify uh, what these practices are doing and give assurances to uh, investors, if you will, and, 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 and policymakers, uh, industry, and, and the public will, will, will really go a long ways towards raising the confidence in, in the ability for, uh, you know, for these approaches to, to, to have a major impact. Uh, so I just in, in closing, uh, I think in the U.S., uh, perhaps a little bit surprisingly, I don't know, and certainly it's, we, we know it's true in the EU and many other countries, but in the U.S., I, I really think there's, we're seeing much more uh, interest uh, at a different level than previously in, in really looking at soils as a, from the standpoint of soil health, but also as a, as a carbon dioxide removal solution. Uh, I do feel strongly that that really our robust and cost-effective quantification methods is really going to be a key in, ingredient for this to possibly go to scale. And I think the the way to approach that that quantification task is really through this idea of of platforms, where we need to bring measurements together with models, together with remote sensing, uh, and we need to to essentially crowdsource some of the information on practices and, and what's happening on the ground. And it needs to all come together in, in, a, in a coherent fashion. And I think that gives us a lot of opportunities to improve our knowledge of, of what's actually happening on the landscape. So I think I'm finished with that and I will 
go ahead and stop sharing and uh, turn it back over to our distinguished chair, Paul. Thank you very much, Keith. Very, very interesting. I think. Thank you very much for all those presentations. We have plenty of questions. Um, please uh, do not answer those questions all immediately, keep some. But whatever the, the, the speaker answer directly on the Q&A, then they disappear, then go in another part. And uh, I will have some difficulty to find them because some of those questions need to be addressed and, uh, in public instead of privately. Okay, so um, we are already late. That's the first time it happened from the beginning of the week. I think we have uh, the problem with the scientists that they are too enthusiastic and they're using too much time. So I will ask our two last speakers to respect carefully the, the time that they, they will have. If not, uh, we will have to shorten the, the discussion and that will be uh, really a, a shame. So our next speaker is Dr. Emily Maillard, researcher with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Quebec, who will talk about overview of the potential of carbon accumulation in soil after different agricultural practices. Dr. Emily Maillard, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Paul. So, thank you for the invitation to Okay, everybody hear me? Well? So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm glad, I'm very glad to be here today to present you uh, a brief overview of the impact of various agricultural practices on soil carbon sequestration. And I will also present you a brief example of initiatives promoting the co-development and adoption of beneficial practices. So I think uh, that uh, today at this meeting, everybody is aware of the importance of soil carbon for soil health as it, it is a main component of soil organic matter, which provides multiple benefits. Soil carbon is also important for the environment, particularly in a disturbed global carbon cycle. As soils represent a large pool of carbon, a small change in soil carbon stock may have significant impact on the atmosphere. So it will be important to better know and to quantify the impact of agricultural practices on soil carbon. After the implementation of a beneficial management practice, we expect an increase of soil carbon until an equilibrium state where there will be no new carbon accumulation in comparison to the reference practice. We can define the soil carbon storage rate as the quantity of additional carbon in comparison to the reference practice divided by the number of years since the implementation. So it's, it is traditionally expressed in tons per hectare and per year. So we can see on the graph that uh, the soil carbon storage rate will decrease uh, in function of time, uh, which is considered for the calculation. The rate of soil car carbon accumulation differs also um, with practices and soil climate conditions. We will see it in the presentation, but overall it seems that this rate is uh, higher for degraded soils. Here is a map of soil organic carbon stock changes across Canada. And we observe uh, in uh, Eastern area um, large decreases in soil uh, carbon stocks, uh, which were related to the conversion from perennial to annual crops. The conversion from perennial to annual crops can lead overall globally across the world to losses of about 20 to 60 percent in Canada it's more about 20 to 30 percent. A study uh, from seven soil series in the province of, of Quebec reported a soil organic carbon 
25% higher in perennials than in annual crops. So we see that it will be important to maintain grasslands to avoid soil carbon losses and uh, increases in atmospheric CO2. After the implementation of perennials, we can expect uh, increases of soil organic carbon in comparison to annual systems. Here are the results of a long-term field experiment in Ontario. And after 20, uh, 35 years, sorry, uh, we observed higher uh, carbon stocks in perennials uh, in comparison to annuals. And it corresponded to an additional soil carbon storage rate of about one ton carbon per hectare and per year. A rotation with perennials and annuals will lead to, will traditionally to intermediary results. Uh, we are between annuals and perennials with the soil carbon stocks and it corresponded to a rate of about 0 0.4 tons of carbon. We observed the um, similar results in a, another long-term experiment in Normandie, uh, in the province of Quebec. After 21 years, we observed higher carbon stocks under the rotation in comparison to a Berlin monoculture. And the storage rate was about 0 0.74 tons of carbon per hectare and per year. We expect uh, that cover cropping and intercropping practices uh, will increase soil carbon stocks uh, with the additional biomass, including roots and higher parts, uh, which will return to soil. Some studies uh, reported that soil carbon increases with cover crops in comparison with main crops not followed by cover crops. Even if uh, this, effect, this effect was only significant after a few years. But there is little data on the impact of intercropping on soil carbon. A global meta analysis uh, reported an additional soil carbon storage rate of about 0 0.32 tons of carbon for cover crops. But there is, that it remains a high variability according to time since implementation, uh, soil tillage, initial soil carbon content, soil type, and climate. And there is a particular need for data in Canada. If we go back to uh, the map of soil uh, carbon stock changes across Canada, we observe in Western Canada that there were large increases in soil carbon due to the reduction of summer fallow on the adoption of no-till. Concerning no-till, uh, we have very different effects on soil carbon accumulation rate between Western and Eastern Canada, like um, Derek uh, uh, said it earlier. Uh, in fact, a study from six long-term agronomic experiments um, reported an additional soil carbon storage rate of about 0 0.14 tons of carbon in Western Canada, but in Eastern Canada, it was equal to zero. And more precisely, for Eastern Canada, uh, the positive effect at soil surface with no till or even reduced tillage is associated with higher carbon stocks with tillage in day. And this, the, these results are also observed in um, other studies in Northern Europe. I also would like to show you uh, some um, rates we can expect with agroforestry systems. Um, here are the results of a long-term experiment in Ontario on a tree-based intercropping system. And we observed that soil carbon stock uh, was higher under crops between poplar trees than under crops without trees. And it led it to a um, soil carbon storage rate of about 0 0.30 tons of carbon. This result was similar 
to uh, another study uh, in France with uh, six sites across France. And they reported a carbon storage rate of about 0.24 tons of carbon. What is interesting with agroforestry systems is the fact that they can store additional carbon stocks in the vegetation. And the carbon sequestration rate is really higher when we consider this part. Uh, here are the results of a global analysis in North America. And the carbon sequestration rate was uh, 2.6 uh, tons of carbon for riparian buffers and 3.4 for tree-based intercropping system. So we see that there, are, there is a promising potential of carbon sequestration with these systems, but there is still research to carry out to refine the estimates and also uh, to study uh, the effects of the different tree species. So we saw with um, the grasslands that uh, after terminating a practice favorable to soil carbon accumulation, we, we may have important carbon losses. We have to keep in mind also the fact that soil carbon in some, is sensitive to climate change. And uh, here are the results of a long-term experiment uh, in Saskatchewan, where we followed um, continuous wheat systems in uh, red with wheat fallow, uh, traditional fallow wheat systems in blue. And during time, we uh, observed an increase uh, in uh, soil carbon stock with continuous wheat systems. But in the last years, we observed a decrease for all systems and it was related to a higher precipitation regime in the last years. So in the context of a probable increase of extreme climatic events in the future years, we can wonder how soil carbon stocks will respond uh, to these climatic events. And there are still many unknowns about the most resilient practices. So uh, I just uh, remind uh, the few uh, practices that uh, we, uh, we saw today. Uh, so these are some potential or some rates that, that we can expect to happen, but uh, we have to, to keep in mind that we, we are not sure that this potential will be attainable in all types of soils. Uh, we have also to remind that this is a temporary solution and also that uh, when we assess if a practice can mitigate climate change, we must not forget that it's necessary also to consider all greenhouse gas emission, emissions associated to this uh, practice. So I think it's, uh, will be, it will be important to promote both research and the adoption of beneficial practices. And some research priorities uh, to define in which conditions the practices offer the better potentials of soil carbon accumulation, and also to determine the sensitivity to cl climatic events. To finish this presentation, I also would like to uh, speak about uh, the Living Laboratories uh, Initiative from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, which is, I think, a good uh, opportunity uh, to promote uh, the adoption of beneficial management practices while pursuing research. So this is an integrated approach to agricultural innovation which reunites uh, farmers, scientists, and other partners. All together, they co-develop um, projects uh, to address priority agri-environmental challenges in uh, different uh, landscapes across Canada. Uh, so last year, the Living Lab in uh, the Atlantic, um, more precisely in Prince Edward Island, uh, started and um, the living lab in the province uh, 
of Quebec should uh, begin this year if the project is approved. Uh, more precisely, the living laboratory uh, from the province of Quebec takes place uh, in three sub-basins uh, in the wool catchment basin of Lake saint pierre The landscapes are dominated by intensive agriculture and uh, in the last year there, there was a strong decline in perennial crops which led to soil erosion and decrease in soil and water quality. Uh, we can observe a uh, low organic matter content around uh, Lake Saint-Pierre. So researchers, farmers and other partners will uh, work on different thematics. Among them there is uh, soil health and mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Here are some uh, future research projects that we would like uh, to carry out uh, in the future years. We uh, would like to assess uh, the impact of uh, cover cropping, intercropping, and also agroforestry systems like halle cropping systems and riparian buffers on soil health and um, also on soil carbon. And uh, we plan to establish benchmark sites at strategic locations within the landscape to monitor short, mid and long term benefits of adoption on ecosystem health. And we would like to model temporal dynamics of soil carbon and nitrogen uh, during time as a function of the adoption level of the beneficial management practices. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Emily Maya, for this presentation. Thank you very much for also respecting the, the time. And uh, I will uh, give the floor now to Dr. Louis-Pierre Como. He is a researcher with Agricultural and Agri-Food Canada, Quebec also, and will present soil biodiversity and carbon storage in Canada. So Dr. Como, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm uh, based in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, not in uh, Quebec, which is small details, maybe. Sorry, no, <laughs> sorry no for that. <laughs> which is good, actually. So we are not all from uh, Quebec and AFC today. Emily is from Quebec, and I'm a little bit further east in New Brunswick. So thanks again for inviting me, uh, Paul. So I will focus my uh, presentation today on the first questions that was uh, shared with us, which is in what uh, domain scientific research effort in North America should be directed in support of soil health and soil carbon sequestration, and specifically filling the knowledge gap concerning uh, soil health and soil organic matter storage. So what I will do is an overview of the research programs that uh, on soil organic matter and soil carbon and soil health that my research group and I have in Atlantic Canada. So as it was a little bit discussed earlier by Dr. Keith Paulsient, there's different techniques to estimate carbon or net carbon less and gain from an ecosystems because it's not carbon, for four mil, it's not about carbon storage per se, but an increase in, in carbons. And how to measure that is, is, is difficult. And the different options or the main techniques that are being used is first the uh, eddy covariance techniques where we measure above the canopy all the carbon or the CO2 that is getting in the system and out the systems that will produce an annual or a daily basis of carbon balance. But a disadvantage of that technique is it's very expensive and it's hard, very difficult to install in a remote area. Another method to, to do the soil carbon balance is the flux balance approach, where we measure everything that is getting in and everything that is getting out. But this approach is very time consuming and uh, labor intensive. So a lot of people need to, be, to go to the field to measure everything that is happening, getting in and everything that is getting out. 
And the method that is uh, normally used, the more traditional method is the soil carbon mass balance, which is relatively easy. You just measure soil carbon mass in different time points. But the big disadvantage of that is due to heterogeneities and a slow change in soil organic modern soil carbon, it normally takes between five and 10 years before we are really able to detect a, a change. And this five to 10 years can be difficult because it will take five to 10 years for us to establish the effect of a management practice, but farmers want to know the results right now. Most of the projects I will present today are related to soil carbon mass change, but I came back to Canada three years ago. So my project started two years ago or three years ago. So everything that I'm presenting today, it's preliminaries. So we are based in Atlantic Canada. It can look small on a map, but Atlantic Canada, it's the size of, approximately the size of, of Japan. It's hard here to increase all organic carbons because our soil are young, silty long with very little clay, a lot of slope, the soil are shallow. And the main crop here is potato that require heavy labor, heavy uh, healing and heavy tillage. The main soil groups that we have in the international classification system are leptosol, glaisol, podsol, stagnosols, Umbrisol, Luvisol, Cambisol, Pluvisol, and Regosols that are all relatively young soils, which in tall soil is harder to increase the soil carbon. So the main projects my lab groups and I are working on is uh, an Atlantic Canada soil carbon survey that will link soil organic matters and biodiversity, trying to find the relationship between the different life organisms in the soil with the soil carbon storage. And we have partner all across Canada for these projects, namely uh, Adrian Honk and Erica Young for the nematodes, the soil organic mother fractionation, Kristen Annan, the Fungi with uh, Dr. Claudia Goye, the Marco Risa with uh, Dr. Cameron Wag, the bacteria again with uh, Dr. Claudia Goye, the enzyme being uh, produced by Dr. Tandra Frasers and the microanthropodes with uh, Dr. Jessica Beetroot. So with that, we hope that we will find a link, not a causal link, but a, a relationship between soil carbon storage and all the biodiversities. And we will be able to follow those points, the 500 points that we are sampling through times every five or every 10 years to see the evolution of all that organic matter and that biodiversity. So the early results that uh, we have, those results are from uh, New Brunswick and a little bit of uh, gas PZ, or the different amount of soil carbons or soil organic carbon in the, right now I'm presenting only the 0 0.15 centimeters on a percentage basis. In the different eco regions, we see that some eco regions has a lower amount of uh, soil organic matters or soil organic carbons, which might be where we could focus if the soil texture is good to potentially increase soil organic matters. And we can see that there's also differences, notable differences in the different nematode, columbola, and mite in the different ecosystems, despite being at the very beginning of this study. Now, if we look at the different land use in this same eco regions that are the eco regions from uh, New Brunswick and the Gaspésie that were sampled last summer, we see that there's notable uh, differences in the soil and carbons between forest, pasture, cropland, and wetlands. Right now, those uh, results on uh, soil carbon on a percentage base, but uh, we will also produce on a mass basis to be able to estimate how much grams of carbons are gain or lost, or what is the difference between the different values. And we are presenting today results only for the 0 0.15 centimeters, but we have also 15 to 30 centimeters that we are not showing because in New Brunswick and in, in Atlantic, the soil is very shallow. So what is happening at 15 to 30 centimeter 
it's, it's a little bit less interesting. So despite uh, being really uh, preliminary, those results already show that uh, nematodes and columbolas and mites are sometimes antagonists one to another and antagonic to soil carbon storage in the soil. So right now, the following steps that we are doing is subdividing the different groups of nematodes and uh, nematodes that are parasit eating uh, plants and the different groups of trophic groups of nematodes, the different groups also of columbolas and mite are groups or only one group of mites. Those two studies are being performed by uh, two students that are co-supervising Erika Young and Vanessa Mosna. So another big study that uh, we are carrying on in Fredericton is the use of uh, mustard as a biofumigant to improve uh, soil organic matter. My side of the projects is for improving soil organic matters. The larger projects is also linked to decrease the objective of decreasing some uh, PED disease in potato. So again, because we start only two years ago, we see on the bottom, bottom left that the amount of carbon is not changing that fast. So we have to go look at the soil organic matter pools that can be affected much more rapidly for, for the change in the management practice. And as uh, Dr. Derek Lynch explained the active C for the pox, this is uh, responding quite fast to different management practice. And in that case, it's responding quite fast as a, a control that is only a barley and no fumigations, biofumigation with mustard and uh, chemical fumigation with uh, flower cryptins. And that uh, figure down, down right, we can see that uh, chemical fumigation seems to block the decomposition of the soil organic matter or the fresh residues before the, the winters. And the biofumigation is increasing the amount of uh, bacteria, the total uh, countable uh, bacteria. But on a very early basis, we don't see a change in soil organic matter. Another large project that uh, we are carrying on, that the larger projects being led by uh, Steve Hurt at the University of uh, UNB in Fredericton, is the effect of uh, spruce bloodworms on the ecosystems and uh, the effect of spraying BTK to control the spruce bloodworm versus non-spraying BTK on the ecosystems. And my part of the projects there is to measure the effect of this control of spruce bloodworm on soil organic matter in the soil, soil carbon in the different uh, layer of soil organic matter. The turf layer, the elephates layers, the soil uh, coarse fragment, the organic fragment in the soil and the, the soil, soil carbon in the soil. We are at the very beginning of the studies. This is kind of time zero where we haven't found any difference yet between the forests that are treated with BTK and forests that are non-treated with uh, BTK on the carbon balance. But with times we are expecting that the forests that are not healthy forests or dying forests because they were infested with the spruce bloodworms would have a boost of soil organic matter at the beginning when the plants, the trees are dying and the needles are falling down. But on the long run, the amount of organic matter in those soils might decrease. This results right now is from uh, New Brunswick. We are also carrying that project in uh, gas physics. Another project that uh, we are evaluating the balance or the potential of carbon sequestration in the region is uh, by adding, adding uh, willow chips into the soil. This is the larger projects led by Yifeng Lab and uh, PEI, where they are looking at the big pictures that the willow can fix nitrate in the soils. And for our part of the projects, we are looking at the effect of the willow on the soil carbon or the soil organic matter and the different pool of soil organic matters. This project is supposed to start uh, till summer and we have the baseline that is a very low amount of uh, soil carbon in the soils that uh, we hope that with the addition of a willow to see for how long the willow will have an effect on the soil organic matter in the soil. And in which 
carbon pool will go to his uh, extra solar organic matter. Another project is uh, with the erosion terrace because there's a lot that is being said about the solar organic matter being gained and lost, but erosion is it, it, it's very damaging. You can lose organic matter from decompositions, but when you have erosion, then you, you lose everything. It's, it's dramatic. And in our regions, we are in the Appalachies and there's a lot of slopes. So there's a lot of organic matter and soil that is being lost by erosion. So this, this projects evaluate the effect of uh, erosion terrace on the flow on the water, the project led by uh, Shang Li. And our part of that is to evaluate the amount of carbon that will be gained or lost on the long terms by those erosion terrace and till drains and the third treatment. And for this projects, we are using both the soil carbon balance and also the flux balance, where we are going to measure every week the three the gases, the greenhouse gas that are being emitted from the soil. The graph on the left is uh, the result from uh, last fall for the CO2 that is being emitted at the different landscape positions in the three treatments, where we can see that where we have more carbons right now, we have a little bit more carbon emissions, which is normal and which was expected. And on the long run, we'll see really if those erosion terrace are generating an increase in soil carbons, and if that increase is offset or no by other greenhouse gas that uh, could be in it, like uh, what Emily talked earlier. If we increase the amount of carbon in the soils, but we also increasing the emission of methane and N2, then there's no real gain on uh, mitigation effect. Another project that uh, we are working on is the uh, restoration of uh, riparian zones or riparian zones uh, management to improve the riparian ecologies. And my part of that is uh, to improve the carbon stock, where we see that the different uh, position in the landscape and different uh, management of the riparian will have a different amount of uh, carbon storage. The early results that uh, we are getting from uh, that, story, that study is that the disturbed part of the riparians have a larger amount of uh, carbon. And what is happening here is most likely that the dis disturbed part is more flat and there's more flooding. So all the materials that are in the flow of the waters are being precipitated in those uh, disturbed areas. But if we had too much disturbed area like that, we would simply have no more flow of, of water. So it's all it's a trade-off that uh, the organic matter that can be deposited and versus having a, a net flow of the water through the channels. A national projects that uh, we are having that uh, we're on the lead and uh, this is the part that I'm presenting here for uh, New Brunswick is the effect of uh, legume on uh, soil carbon dynamics. As I said earlier, uh, potato is the main crop in, in the regions, and potato is very hard for the soil organic matter for so much tillage being uh, induced and the hill being so so big. And when the potato is harvested, the soil is pretty much seed, which then makes the microbes, the organic matter, available to microbes. So there's a very fast loss and a lot of erosion. And it has been shown in the, in the prairies that the incorporations of uh, pulse crops and uh, rotation can increase the solar organic matter. So we started that project two years ago, having uh, with incorporated with potatoes, pea, baba bean, uh, barley as a control. In the regions here in New Brunswick is often barley potato, barley potato, the, the rotation with uh, nothing else. And another one that is, uh, uh, oil seed, soybean, and then the second phase is all on the winter wheat and the cover crop after winter wheat. And this is, uh, we, we should not uh, make a discussion and conclusion with those early uh, results, but uh, we see that we might see further in the future an effect of those uh, pulls and those legumes on the soil organic matter balance in this 
system in New Brunswick. Here, a project that was uh, started before. Yes. A project that was uh, started before uh, I start by Dr. Zibat, where uh, compost is often uh, considered uh, a carbon storage to increase carbon, but the compost in the soil will uh, decompose relatively quick. So here we compare different type of compost and we follow the decomposition of uh, compost in times to see for how long this extra compost will, will last in, in our system in, in New Brunswick. And we can see that different compost does not react all the same to the carbon storage. The compost that we have here, the SSSO, is a compost with more nitrogens in it. And it, it often assumes that more nitrogens will accelerate the decomposition, but here, more nitrogens in the compost make the compost more stable to decomposition in time. And this is linked to uh, biodiversity in the soil that is being evaluated by Dr. Claudia Moyen. I, I believe the last uh, projects that are the one before the last projects that we are working on is the effect of biochar in rotation with potato. The biochar has a great potential, but uh, this big project was uh, looking also at the biochar on potato. Would the potato roots react positively or negatively with the biochars? And what is being shown right now is the CO2 flux, but we will also have the carbon balance on the long run of the uh, projects with biochar, with different kind of biochar and a different quantity of biochar. And our last uh, project, that is a project that was started, a uh, famous project that was started a long time ago by uh, Dr. Ed Brevaret that measured different uh, decomposition rate with uh, material enriched in 13C. And we will restore that project with different type of plants. That original study was made only with barley. And now we will follow the decomposition in 13C with the legumes and non-legumes plants through times. And coming back to, to finish with my original question, in what domain scientific research effort in North America should be directed in support of soil health and soil carbon sequestrations, filling knowledge gaps concerning soil health and COC? There's still a lot of management practice that needs to be evaluated. In the regions, there's a lot of uh, tree, tree, tree fruit plantings, blueberries, and the effect of climate change on, on that that needs also to be evaluated. And, and finally, I will uh, finish, finish with a statement with a colleague of me on uh, Brini Ziba, Dr. Brini Zimata. Soil organic matter is like your bank account. You have to be sure that you keep a healthy balance. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kobo, with uh, that last good sentence i think this is wise to to say that well we we are quite late in our schedule but it's normal you have one more presentation than the other day so it took a little bit longer and um, i would like first to start immediately the uh, the questionnaire so if my colleague that are controlling with me this meeting can launch the this questionnaire for the participant to start um, working on the on the answer and then we will at the same time start uh, having the question for our panelists great so it seems to start um, I will um, so we have plenty of questions some of you already start answering on the QA uh, part uh, I will limit uh, to one question to to all of you because I think we will be a little bit short of time and it will depend on the length of your answer, of course. So to Dr. Uh, Derek Lynch, we have the question uh, concerning the, the crops and the change of diet. So looking at how these crops have changed over time towards commodity types, how does that correlate with diet? Has the Canadian diet changed? And if so, are there, is there systemic effort to educate the market on those linkage? So can you, Derek, can you answer this question? Well, I, I think I did respond briefly in, in the yes, text, but- Yes, uh, in public. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a great question. I mean, it's the ultimate connecting all the whole value chain and 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 linking the consumer and uh, and the dietary choices and and consumption choices back to all the way back to soil health, and that that that's uh, ultimately uh, in a way the purpose of this week as well. To look at all engage all the stakeholders, including all of us who eat, in in, in the impact of those choices. I don't know of any studies that have tracked Canadian dietary change uh, in that much of a direct link back to, to agricultural um, uh, impact. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I'm sure there are, but I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be able to pull them up at, at short notice. But, uh, but, I, but engaging those, I mean, that's part of one of our panel questions and uh, market mechanisms, that's related to that question about uh, market recognition uh, and, and food choices is part of that uh, to, to, to support adoption of, of uh, improved practices uh, for soil health and soil carbon. Okay, thank you. Um, a quick question for Dr. Brendan Hugg. Um, what factor determines the accuracy of digital soil mapping and how much more and what type of data is needed to create accurate soil map for carbon sequestration baseline? Um, well, I, uh, there are many different factors that can lead to inaccurate maps or higher uncertainties. Like, for example, the Closer to the mic, please. Oh, uh, so for example, like the quality of the data, uh, analytical methods, um, accuracy of the spatial positioning and all that sort of thing. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of perhaps identifying places to go sample more, uh, what we should really be doing is taking stock of what data that we do have that is available, um, generating predictive maps and generating maps of uncertainty. And those uncertainty estimations could help us guide uh, where we should go sample in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Keith, a question for you. Um, could offers of subsidy for carbon sequestration for specific farm allow for more labor intensive evaluation on a small scale that could be, that would be accurate with compensation based on performance? So it means applying for a subsidy would require a starting data set of evaluate future gains. So just how, how we can start to, to baseline for, for the future yeah. compensation. Yeah, thanks. And I think I can answer, the, answer that with another one that was in there that was asking about the companies like uh, Nori and oh, Indigo yes. that are trying to, 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 to go you know, into the carbon market space. Um, so I, 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 and I, Speaking of Nori, Indigo, Regen Network, some of the others, I think, are very much viewing this idea of a of a kind of a platform, and they want to use both measurements and models together. Uh, so I, I think that's a positive. Uh, and and Nori, for example, has the option. So their default quantification involves actually use of Comet Farm, the tool that we've developed, but they also uh, participants have the option of of using a direct measurement approach and they can get a higher they can get a reduced uh, discount for uncertainty with that but they also have to bear the higher cost for uh, you know for those direct measurements using kind of traditional methods I you know personally I think that we we definitely need we should have a, a certain percentage of farms that are engaging in adoption of practices to get ecosystem service payments should be, they, they sh, you know, we should take a sample of those and do very intensive direct measurement monitoring over time because we need to have that kind of information to evaluate and true up the models if the models are gonna be used kind of routinely for, for quantification. But we definitely need more, you know, direct measurement uh, uh, you know, data from on-farm, on-farm monitoring systems. Uh, and, and so I think if the, uh, you know, if, 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 if a select group of farmers can be chosen at random to do this, and if, they, if there can also be more investment on the part of governments for, 
you know, for, for monitoring changes over time in soil, soil health and soil carbon, uh, because we want to see what the changes are over time, that, that that's a, I think that's an indispensable part of it. But I think we can use that data with the models, with the remote sensing to, to do something that's, that's uh, uh, tractable and cost effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, a question for Emily. Um, you, you were talking about intercropping and uh, agroforestry system. So do we know what is the impact of tree-based intercropping system on crop yields? Euh, ben, ben oui, en fait, il y a quand même un certain nombre d'études qui, euh, qui ont regardé quand même euh, des, des systèmes agroforestiers, en particulier au Québec. Euh, Là, je référerai en fait aux travaux de David Rivet, Alain Olivier. Et, et en fait, sur le rendement, je pense qu'il y avait comme un compromis un peu à trouver en fait au niveau de la largeur des bandes entre les arbres. Et donc, je pense qu'il y avait des premiers dispositifs qui avaient été implantés où on se retrouvait à avoir une compétition plus tard dans le temps là, au niveau des rendements en fait. Des, des cultures entre les arbres, mais que euh, avec des, avec une, maintenant il y a des, des systèmes de deuxième génération, je pense, qui, euh, qui euh, permettent en fait un meilleur compromis. Et puis euh, peut-être euh, dans le cadre justement du, du, des réunions un petit peu du laboratoire vivant euh, dans la province de Québec, euh, on a un producteur justement qui a un système agroforestier, puis lui a vraiment remarqué que euh, il avait euh, un rendement meilleur en fait sur ses parcelles euh, entre les bandes d'arbres. Euh, donc euh, ben, c'est le genre d'info qu'on aimerait bien euh, aller, euh, aller vérifier en fait dans le futur. Merci beaucoup pour cette réponse en français. Thank you for this answer in French. Um, Louis Pierre, um, you, you were talking about the the use of uh, chips, wood chips, and uh, you also mentioned a project with biochar. Um, is there a comparison between those two? Uh, you, are you examining the impact of adding into soil some biochar re regarding the nematode and mites, along with increasing carbon content? And did you have comparison between uh, willow chips, uh, willow wood chips uh, and, and biochar in terms of result of carbon sequestration? I will try to restate the, the question to see if I understood uh, correctly. With uh, one part with the biodiversity, the other part of uh, willow chips, and the other part of uh, uh, willow chips and biochar. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, or the characteristic right now, those are different uh, studies that are independent. On the uh, willow chip and the biochar experiments, there's no measurements as far as I know of uh, biodiversity and nematodes and columbola. Maybe in the future that could be an option that we, we could consider. And uh, biochar and willow chips are uh, different experiments. In, in the future, it would also be interesting in comparing the effect of the willow chip inside the soil that already has uh, biochar. Yeah, that's something that we should consider that uh, right now there's no data about that and we don't have any experiment that is doing that currently. Okay, thank you very much. So I encourage our participants to continue to answer the question. Uh, only 27 of you did that. So we have 72 persons in line. So please continue to answer the, this question. This is important for, for the follow-up of our meeting as well. So um, maybe a last, uh, one of the last question, we still have some minutes. Uh, Keith, um, MRV seems to be a priority now. Uh, how much time do you think it is necessary to obtain results useful for the farmers? Because there were a lot of questions about uh, the, the possibility to apply all those results of science to the farmers. And uh, people said, you, you show us beautiful maps, but they are not very useful for the farmers. Uh, we don't need those maps. We need the money to, to do the work. Farmers is a, an entrepreneur and he is making the, the balance between the money getting out and in. So, uh, well, this is a general question about 
MRV, MAPS, and all those scientific um, results that we are providing today, well, what is the usefulness for the farmers and when do you think they will benefit from this part of the science? You start, Keith? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, for the farmers, I think they, they want, uh, uh, they, they want really place-based specific information about their operations. And I think they want to, uh, and, and they, they want to, they don't want to have to put a huge amount of effort into that. They want, they want systems to leverage the information that they already collect and maintain in terms of their farm management. Um, uh, I think they're, uh, and, you know, and, and, and I think they, they want to know about, again, change is, is the, is the key thing. I think our, you know, is the direction we're moving good or bad. And from the standpoint of monetizing ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, you know, am I gaining carbon or losing carbon? Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think there are, you know, there are methods there that are, uh, that are operational uh, now, and it's still early days. Uh, you know, the, the, the various registries, the Climate Action Reserve and, and Vera and, and others like that have uh, the problems, their protocols have been designed for, for big projects. They're, they're cumbersome, expensive. You know, I, I think that uh, you know, the work that we've been doing with USDA to try to develop this Comet Farm platform is an example of trying to make it easier to get the information into farmers' hands. I think we still have a ways to go in terms of making that, um, you know, uh, inter in interface more with, uh, you know, with the information that the farmers have to make it easier for, for people to use. But I, so I, you know, I, I guess I'm optimistic. I think that that we have some capabilities now that begin to guide policy. Uh, I, but I think to really take it to scale to encourage big investment, then we need to further make improvements and uh, and have systems that are that are are easier to use, uh, have demonstrably better reliability, reduced uncertainty. I think if we keep moving in that direction, we'll gain more and more confidence of, of you know, of, of that broad set of stakeholders that are interested in this. Thank you, Keith. We'll move on to... Could I answer? Uh, yes, Derek. On that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned I'm excited to see how much the farmer organizations, producer groups are, are engaged and often leading the initiatives on soil health. And, but I'll, I agree with Keith, you know, the information has to get far more fine tuned in terms of local production systems. Uh, what best management practice is really going to shift. And in the Eastern Canada context, we're not necessarily talking about necessarily yet a gain in soil carbon, we're trying to reduce the losses. So in that case, you're not necessarily accessing voluntary markets who are only paying for net gains in soil carbon. So who's supporting those systems to make uh, some changes? So I think there's a policy role there for, uh, we heard earlier in the week talking about de-risking best management practices, whose shares, is there some insurance mechanism to help farmers and, and uh, partner with them in, in exploring uh, new uh, ch shifts in uh, and exploring new uh, production systems or cover cropping or whatever, whatever it might be. I'm very glad to hear the uh, National Roundtable on Sustainability. That will engage the agricultural sector on thinking about the mechanisms to, to support the agricultural community down at the farm level in, in, in exploring some of these um, uh, tools and, and uh, both soil carbon and soil health. So um, yeah, I think it's it's a multifaceted approach, a multi-stakeholder approach um, uh, that that's needed to to partner with uh, right down at the farm level and and help track uh, the changes over time in soil carbon and soil health. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody who want to have a last word? No, it's okay. No regrets, Emily, Brandon, Louis Pierre. Okay. 
Thank you. So this brings us to the end of our third session. And uh, I would like to thank uh, very warmly all our speakers as well as uh, all our participants for, for this. And without forgetting our translator, they are very useful, even though uh, I'm not listening to them, I should confess, but they were, they were very useful for, for the people who are not speaking English. Thank you all for your loyalty. The first day we were 92 online. Yesterday we were 80 and today we were 88 participants. So that, that's great. It's just maintained, it's just perfect for us. And we really enjoy to, to have this, uh, this meeting going on for several days. So we, we are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time for our fourth session devoted to NGOs and civil society point of view. Most probably that will be different from today. Um, I just would like to recall you that uh, for as for each session, tomorrow's meeting will be accessible via Zoom, specific Zoom link different to the one of today. And um, you will find that on the agenda of the meeting. Uh, I just have a look to my friend from uh, Regeneration Canada. Do you want to add something, Gabrielle, to end this session? Sure, just very briefly, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, but uh, just I want to thank you so much, Derek, Brandon, Keith, uh, Emilie, Louis Pierre. These were such fascinating presentations and uh, you know, advancing our understanding of soil carbon dynamics and how to most effectively measure, quantify, and model soil carbon is so key if we are to scale up regenerative land management. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise in that regard. Uh, thanks, uh, Paul and Beatrice, for another successful session. So um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all for tomorrow, tomorrow morning's session on uh, civil society and the point of view of NGOs. OK, so have a good day and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Béatrice, tu es toujours là Oui, Béatrice, est-ce que... Tu as pu prendre les photos de... <rire> Elle n'a pas mis son micro, mais là, je vois que les, les, les sondages, le sondage est terminé maintenant, c'est ça Le sondage Et... est terminé, alors après, c'est juste de prendre les... Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que là, là, maintenant, on a eu 34. Donc, quand elle a commencé à prendre des photos, en fait, on s'est aperçu qu'il n'y avait, euh, avait que 30. Et là, maintenant, on est à 34. Maintenant qu'il est clos, elle, il faut qu'elle prenne son temps de, de prendre le, les photos. Ouais, et... euh, okay, elle a dit, OK, elle a dit dans notre... Oui, ça y est, c'est bon. bon. <rire> avec, les, avec les 34 réponses. Normalement, oui, c'est bon. Bon, et eh bien, c'est super. Alors, à tout à l'heure. On se retrouve on dans 5 minutes. Merci pour aller. Eh bien. Je vais, je vais tu tu, tu peux fermer. Merci. Parfait. Merci. Au revoir. Merci.